we are starting with air quality. Um, we're starting with a, a global picture that looks like this. Um, there's a number of different statistics you could use to quantify what the, the damage is of our polluting environments we have in some of our cities. Uh, and the one I'm going to use is the OECD estimate, and it's a relatively conservative estimate of £3 trillion per annum that is the cost to the health service, the cost to economic output due to uh, poor air quality. And there are a number of reasons why we're not spending that scale of money on the solutions at the moment. Um, uh, and what we really need to be doing is understanding those budgets are constrained, they're constrained for a reason, and therefore we need to be doing exactly what was mentioned earlier, of making sure we are spending that money uh, as effectively as possible um, and identifying the really critical problem areas. And there's a whole range of stakeholders from central governments, local governments, the public, um, uh, environmental agencies, um, interest groups, etc., etc., not just in the UK, but across the world. So what we're looking at here is a system which enables space data to be integrated with terrestrial sensors and modelling in order to provide a cohesive picture across a city to understand where the risk set sections are. And what Hotspot Mapper is doing in a, in a single phrase is working out what we can do to help manage those critical areas, those hotspots. And we have an example of the space data on the far top left. This is the Copernicus Atmosphere Service. It is nitrogen dioxide, and there's also particulate matter uh, modelling there as well, so you can understand the health risk. So on, a, on an individual scale, you can understand how much of that pollution is being imported into the UK, imported into your city, and how much of it is actually a local problem produced by your local transport, um, and therefore you can maybe directly manage in your local environment. We, the challenge we have at the moment is our space data is about 20 kilometres resolution. And this is just an example over the UK of what that looks like. That isn't much information to go by. And when you're looking to uh, assess an, an intervention measure on a street scale, that kind of information you're really struggling to, to make use of. But by the end of this year, we will have this scale of information, 7 by 7 kilometres. We will have that daily, just as we have daily uh, data at the moment. But by the end of 2020, that will come in hourly. We will have geostationary satellites up there providing us with much more information. Now, we are working with, under the, the Centre for Earth Observation Instrumentation with Surrey Satellites and Tyler's Lania Space at concepts that were delivered by 2025, one kilometre resolution data. So that's the UK able to lead the upstream services and upstream development of this as well as the downstream services. And what does that do for our understanding of cities? It would take it from um, understanding where the critical areas on a suburban scale are to actually seeing individual roads and individual industrial estates. So what did we do under SSGP? We created a service which was available via the web to a couple of uh, local authorities um, that enabled them to see their local air quality. This is an example of that web browser. Um, uh, it shows the 10,000 most polluted squares. These are 20 by 20 meter squares. In a, in a city environment, the user can go in, they can zoom, they can have a look at individual areas. Um, very, very easy to access and direct access to an awful lot of information fed in from, uh, from in-situ sensors as well as the space data, as well as traffic models, as well as dispersion models, meteorological data, all fed in to the point where we understand what's going on on a very fine scale. We also provided that in Google Earth, so again, any user can just go in and navigate around and see where those risk areas are and which streets to avoid. This is the World Health Organization um, risk le uh, levels. Green is generally okay, yellow is starting to look a bit risky, so these areas around here is where you put your gas mask on if you need to. But it's that, that kind of information that you you didn't have before is all based on what building you have, what trees you have, what import of pollution you have, and our understanding of how much that pollution is trapped and how much it's dispersed. And this model is updated every 15 minutes. So the Google Earth screen updates every 15 minutes, as does that web interface um, for the end user. We also gave direct access to space data. Now, this shows a, a European scene of ozone. And you can see there it doesn't vary too much spatially in terms of what the model tells us. It tells us whether there's going to be a heat wave, whether ozone's going to get high, whether you're going to have real challenges, particularly with the elderly, of heat and ozone combining to cause respiratory problems. But it doesn't give you that street, street scale, but that's what will come in the future. So if we now look at a, a few discrete examples of what this hotspot mapper can be used for. This is one... Uh, data product that just looks at buildings and understands which buildings in the cities are on average exposed to the worst le levels of pollution 
Um, and then you can understand what you need to do with your air filtration systems, where you put your people, what activity they need to be um, worried about in terms of uh, what levels. You can look at your hospitals, you can look at your schools, and you can understand the level of risk in each of those scenarios. One of the things we did was we looked at health, and we had a partner that came in, and this was the Leicester Diabetes Centre, and they'd done a whole load of studies on diabetes prevalence. And they'd understood and published a very good study that said, okay, the more people are close to green space, the less the risk of diabetes. There's obviously a whole lot of different factors that can come into that correlation. What is it about being close to green space that makes you less likely to have diabetes? So, again, there's a nice link here with our local centre of excellence um, for the, the SATAPS catapult. We met these people and we started giving them data. Now, I can't give you the full results of this, but it is very exciting. This is one quote I've been allowed to show that basically says there is a correlation between pollution and type 2 diabetes, even after you've discounted all of the different factors, the genetics, um, the age, et cetera, et cetera, of those cohorts. It does look like there is a link. There is a causal link, um, potentially, between the air quality and the diabetes. And that not only will have profound implications um, for our understanding of the health impacts of air quality and long-term exposure and short-term exposure, but also leads to our understanding of how we plan our urban environments and to what extent we need to be really encouraging physical activity by identifying not only the hot spots, but also the clean spots. And I'll just illustrate this with this map here. We have trees, we have all the buildings in our modelling, and we can be identifying which routes are safest for, for walkers, uh, for cyclists. So when you're taking exercise, which we want everybody to do, we want people to go in and breathe deeply, um, we know the best, the safest areas to do that and what implications that might have for human health. So just looking at the benefits for the end user... <clears throat> Leicester Diabetes Centre, that was very nice, clear benefit. They were immediately able to take that data in and use it in their studies in a way that they, they could just understand what the average concentrations were over the last few years for their cohort of people. For Leicester City Council, they were actually most interested in understanding how buildings trapped pollution on a street scale. So under the meteorology helped from space. The import of pollution helped to understand what that local environment may be. They're also looking at the information on the representativity of, of sites. So they've got a number of sites. They're quite expensive to buy. They're quite expensive to maintain. They want to know how representative those are around the city. Again, we could inform that with the potential to reduce the costs to them um, of their existing monitoring network. We also ran this for Rotherham. And for Rotherham, it was interesting that their, their key use for this was for particular intervention measures. So they had a, a problem school uh, next to a, a busy road where they were looking at an intervention measure to improve the air quality. And what we've done is we've tailored our Rotherham model to go in and help with that specific situation. Now, we, it would be nice to get to a point where this modelling was usable for some of our regulatory compliance work. So the ability to report back to the European Union, this is the average exposure of our population. We're not there yet, but one day we might do, particularly as satellite information improves and that resolution gets there. How are we going to deliver this in the future? I'm from the University of Leicester. I'm an academic. This has come out of the academic base to a certain extent. What we're doing is we're creating a joint venture company that will, in the future, be responsible for delivering air quality data to a wide range of services. And that will be a commercial basis um, that will ingest space data along with a whole load of terrestrial data and application of models. And we work with Geospatial Insight in this project, and the final delivery of Air Quality Hotspot Map will be via Geospatial Insight, and that will be tailored to specific user needs in the marketplace to the point where the research base has been integrated into a commercial supply chain. The business case for EarthSense has 25 people being employed in four years' time, so we've already created a business. We will be creating jobs. So just to give a little bit more detail on that, we will be, through Geospatial Insight, we'll be exploring new and established markets for air quality information, understanding where people might use this, providing both visualization tools and auxiliary data sets. So where are all the schools? Where are the other risk factors? Where, how are people interacting with this, this potential hazard? And providing that tailor, uh, tailored user, uh, end user service. And then collating metrics, whether that's a annual averages, hourly exceedances, whatever metric that end user may want from that core data set to, be, to enable them to make better decisions and plan their urban environments. And then the new company, EarthSense, will be creating that fundamental data set. It will be ingesting space data and understanding the information content of it, both with the current generation and with the future generation of satellite instruments as they get better. So what are the next steps? Complete the diabetes studies. I'd love to tell you more. It is exciting. And when that study is completed, 
Um, our health colleagues will be publishing that, and it will be a very good advert for what we've done here under the Space for Smarter Government programme. Engage end users in funded programmes. Make sure we've understood their, their specific needs and then work with them to understand the value that has to them and start providing that through that commercial delivery chain I've just outlined. Ingest Sentinel 5P data, due to be launched at the end of this year. We're, we're leading the CalVal team for the UK, so we're helping the European Space Agency understand how good that data is over the United Kingdom. And they're really wanting to understand how that data can be compared with complex urban environments. It is a real fundamental research challenge and we're at the cutting edge of that, and the Hotspot Mapper gives us a fantastic tool to feed into that process. So, conclusions. SSGP has enabled the development and demonstration of this generalised air quality service for local authorities and health researchers. There's applications, both are there, and we've identified critical places where we can help people. We've established a commercial framework um, which will tailor bespoke services to these end users in the future, and we have created a new company that will deliver both hot air quality hotspot mapper and a range of other things. So I'd like to acknowledge uh, a wide team of people from the University of Leicester um, and Geospatial Insight who have delivered this. And I'd like to thank the UK Space Agency and SSGP for the support, and we look forward to delivering the commercial services. Thank you very much. Uh, so are there any questions for, for Roland in regards to this uh, project? Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank Roland. Uh, not only has he kept to time, he's actually been ahead of time. So no pressure on the other speaker, <laughs> but we've, we've set a standard, I'm just saying. <laughs> Great. Uh, Guy, can you just wait for the mic? Sorry. Yeah, hi. I didn't quite catch. I, I, is your focus for end users the sort of the city council and so forth, or is it actually people who, you know, ordinary citizens who want to know about air quality and how they could interact with the clean rather than the dirty spots? It, it is both. Um, this service was targeted at local authorities, and therefore we had um, a business model that was about how we provide that wide information across the city and help the planning decisions and help forecasting for that local authority. But the, the, the raw information content could be provided in an app, it could be provided on a smartphone to an end user, and there's a, 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 an increasing awareness. Um, in the general public now as to what information that might have, whether it's house prices, um, local safety as you walk around, uh, the kind of decisions you make in terms of the exercise and where around that city you take it. So this information could be for the public, it could be for a whole range of users to, uh, to local authorities, to central government. Your, your current partner is focused on local authorities? Yes. Yeah. Uh, hi, Rick Park, Natural Resources, Wales. Um, from an incident response perspective, is there a scope here to be able to monitor um, with this 15-minute resolution an actual incident relating to air quality? So, for example, a power station incident or a major industrial incident, can, if, if we bought into the system, could we utilise that as part of our incident response programme? Yes, so this system in, ingests um, a whole lot of terrestrial data. Um, at the moment, we have both static sensors and mobile sensors. We're working for the, with the Department of Transport, um, instrumenting electric vehicles. So we've got 15 Le Leicester City vans, which will be driving around with, with sensors on them. So that level of network of information is fed in on a minute-by-minute -minute basis, and every 15 minutes you ingest that into the model, you produce an answer. So if there were to be an incident that were detectable by the environmental sensors, so that's NO2, ozone, particulate matter... So anything in, in reducing smoke or particularly high concentrations of pollutants, we would monitor and the model would pick up and show very clearly. We're also involved in the European Space Agency project to divert traffic around um, key air quality hotspots called UTRAC, and that feeds the air quality data directly into the traffic management system and changes the ratio of red to green on traffic lights to, to nudge people around hotspots. So we're already in a system where that data is fed into an operational um, situational awareness uh, system and that has in fact accidents in it and, and other such things so yes in so theory that, that would work for, for wales though as it stands at the moment that's something in the future rather than you know just so i'm making sure i'm not missing something here so for wales right you know it's something in north wales or south wales mm -hmm. at the moment um the satellite element side of it it would be the only reliance for monitoring uh pollution air, air quality issues 
So the satellite at the moment gives you one measurement uh, at about the middle of the day. So in terms of real-time operational yeah. system for disasters, it's so not it's in, very in suitable. In the future, there will be scope. For... In the future, there's scope, particularly when we have hourly data. That helps yeah. you pick up things like Bunsfield the next time around. You'll pick right. that up much more cleanly yeah. with the, yeah. the satellite data. But as soon as you've got a terrestrial network in there, that'll, that'll feed in. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks. Hi, Roland. Uh, Andy German, Innovate UK. Um, thanks for that. Uh, it's slightly outside the scope for SSGP because obviously that's a UK focus, but have you got plans to take this overseas? Yeah, I, I meant to make that point. I started off with that global perspective. It is a £3 trillion pound global market, a global need, um, and if we start spending anything like that kind of money, the, the air quality market will just go huge relative to what it is right now. The UK has exceptional capabilities in this area um, in terms of the modelling, the, the Met Office, the, the meteorology we have. Um, some of the air quality modellers in this company in this country are fantastic. And there is a real opportunity to take this to the Chinas, Indias, developing areas of the world which have much, much worse air quality issues than we do. We're, we're in a situation where we can invest in particularly sophisticated solutions and then take them overseas in a, in a rather more sort of um, cost-reduced way once you've got to scales. So, yes, the, the global potential of this is, is there. Um, and we do just need to hit that export market. Hello, Chris Jacobs from the Government Office for Science. Um, I'm interested in um, a little bit more about the um, how much you rely on sort of free space data and and also how much you actually do to the data yourselves before then getting it out. Could you say a little bit more about that, please, and, and what that means for your costs? So at the moment, um, the 20-kilometre the data is fed into a Copernicus service that gives hourly modelled information, and that is all free at the point of use for the end users. It's funded by um, our subscriptions to the European services. Um, so that is a, an FTP service anybody can get access to and is completely free of charge. The challenge will come when the new satellite data comes in at 7-kilometre uh, uh, resolution. The model is fundamentally about 50-kilometre resolution information, and you can interpolate it, but you don't get any more information than that. So the new generation of satellites will give us fundamentally more information if we can use that data directly and not just rely on the free model data. So that's where the opportunity to innovate, to use a certain amount of fundamental understanding to improve on the, the free, ex freely accessible data. But it is worth saying the Copernicus service has been a game changer for a lot of people in that it provides a 72-hour forecast in a very standard format, 99 point something percent reliability. It's certainly never failed on us over many years. So you always know you're going to have an answer for NO2 regardless of cloud cover, regardless of satellite data latency. Uh, thanks very much. Um, thank you to thank you. Roland. Um, it's <laughs>